annexing Texas from Mexico. What gives him the authority to do that? Now it leads to the perception of many people that, hey, because now Texas is being carved out of Mexico, that this is basically a legal expansion of slavery into Texas and the Southwest. Kind of an executive order type thing now. Now slavery can, can move into the Southwest and those other states and territories. Benton, Senator Thomas Benton, renounces the treaty as uh, extension is what he calls of legal slavery in the new area. And Claiborne actually openly and publicly opposes Jack or Benton's stance. Now you have the Whig Party, as I mentioned earlier, emerging and becoming into little prominence, and they their press reports that Jackson will not support Benton in the next election. But but he does. But he does. Most Missourians uh, during this time period considered themselves as Westerners with no political affiliation to either North or South. And the right of slavery's extension into the new territories or states shouldn't be restricted. In other words, people should be free to choose. This was the concept of most of the citizens of Missouri. Now, the folks up in the uh, Boonslick Trace uh, said, no, no, they figured they were pro-slavery for everything. You know, it had to be pro-slavery or nothing in their, in their estimation. So this was the Texas issue that uh, caused a, more of a split in the Democratic Party in Missouri. Jackson's re-elected the House in 1844 and he's elected Speaker. Benton verbally now opposes the war with Mexico, which took place in 1846-1847. He supports it legislatively, but uh, he also supported, back in 1842, an amendment which came known as the Wilmot Proviso. Maybe you've heard that term. Which uh, Mr. Wilmot tried to attach to the Texas bill which would prohibit slavery in any territory gained from Mexico. Now, Jackson didn't like this, and he challenged the legality of the Missouri Compromise, which, remember, put a bottom at the base of the, the uh, boundaries of our present state down in the boot hill. Everything north of that would be free to choose. Everything south could, could uh, become slave states. Now, he stirred the anti-Benton uh, anti pot again by uh, saying the Missouri Compromise was uh, illegal in its effect. And as Speaker of the House, he and John Napton, another representative, drafted the State of Missouri Resolutions. Number one, the U.S. Congress has no right to legislate against slavery in any of the territories. Number two, encourage popular sovereignty in the territories to equalize the union of the states. And both Jackson and Napton believe that because slavery is in all right in the state of Missouri, that it will move gradually westward into Kansas and Colorado and everything. And he won't be limited and people will not then be uh, prone to vote for popular sovereignty or free choice. It'll take its normal course. And the third item was, this is, this is the real killer. You release Missouri from the Missouri Compromise for the sake of harmony and the preservation of the Union. So what we're saying now is, down here, Missouri is no longer a recipient of the restrictions that the Missouri Compromise stated. So, also, what he does now as Speaker, he and Napton send a letter to the Congress and says, if the U.S. Congress passes any of those acts that are contrary to the will of the Missourians, Missouri is going to cooperate with the slaveholding states. 
and they instruct, or I use the term demand, Missouri senators to conform to those three restrictions above. And also, of course, Benton opposes those resolutions and loses in 18, the 1848 election. Johnson's re-elected, or Jackson's re-elected the House in 1852, but he loses in 1854. As I mentioned earlier, the vast majority of Missourians, they wanted neither alliance with North or South, but they wanted to become a part of the separate Middle West uh, with no alliances. Another contentious issue which really caused consternation in the political makeup of the state was the 1854 Kansas-Nebraska Act, where the Kansas should come in as a slave state because Nebraska came in as a free state. Now, the final act, final form, was uh, set up by Stephen Douglas, who proposed the philosophy of popular sovereignty. Uh, you know, let the territories uh, choose their right, let the, and when they became states, they could choose their, their right, whether they wanted to be free or, or uh, slave. Here again, Missouri's citizens thought they would settle the Kansas issue because, uh, you know, that was a normal expansion westward. But the Northeasterners, through the immigrants' uh, aid societies, began flooding the Kansas territory with settlers and upsetting the southern-leaning Missourians. So now the state of Missouri is very, very ripe for a strong pro-independent leadership. After losing the election in 54, Jackson Farms acquires more land and more wealth and during the next few years, and he acquires up to 47 slaves, and he inherits and or purchases Dr. Sappington's farm estate. So with the third Sappington daughter at his side, uh, uh, he's able to probably muscle in a little bit because of his position as chief financial officer of the businesses. Uh, enough uh, leverage to buy the Sappington properties. He's defeated in 1856 for the Missouri House of Representatives again, but he's appointed uh, the first state bank commissioner in the state of Missouri for an annual salary of $5,000. Big paying job. Pro-slavery politicians gained control of the Missouri Congress in the mid-58 elections, and Jackson's nominated for governor in April of, 19, of 1860. He's elected governor with about 47% of the vote, a little higher uh, plurality than Lincoln got in the state of Missouri. And uh, elections are held in November, like they are now. Inaugurations of political peoples back then did not take place until March. So you had basically Governor Stewart, Robert Stewart, as a lame duck governor through November, December, and January and February, four months, a third of the year. And Stewart denied Missouri's right to secede. He said, no, Missouri is not going to secede from the Union. Now, Jackson wants to move neutral Missouri into the Southern Confederacy. And he slants all of his ideas and political uh, agendas to look to the South for its protection and security. And in St. Louis, then, an organization called the Minutemen, Minutemen come to be, in fact, organized. Jackson, when he's governor, he issues a call for a state convention, and uh, the delegates Unfortunately for Jackson, were overwhelmingly union, with about 80% of the delegates to the state convention having union sentiments. Sterling Price, this time, is kind of neutral again uh, for a while, and he is elected the convention president, and one month later, the convention votes 98 to 1 that, quote, no cause existed to impel Missouri to dissolve her connections with the Federal Union. So this is probably the ultimate political rebuke for Jackson. I mean, this, this really hits him strong. It, and then, of course, President Lincoln issues his call for troops, and Jackson replies uh, that the approximate 3,100 troops that uh, Missouri would furnish uh, will not be furnished uh, and writes back to the president and says, Sir, your requisition is illegal. 
unconstitutional and revolutionary in its subject, inhuman and diabolical. So not one man will Missouri furnish to carry on such an unholy crusade against her southern sisters. So this is a letter that uh, goes back to Lincoln when the requisition comes to the Union too. So now you have a pretty good idea of which way the, uh, the state of Missouri is going. You have uh, the Camp Jackson affair, which takes place in, uh, I think it's Tower Grove Park area now, uh, in St. Louis, uh, where the Minutemen are mustering for a drill, and uh, at that time a young firebrand, red-headed captain named Nathaniel Lyon and some federal troops uh, have been previously ordered into St. Louis from Fort Scott, Kansas. So they are on hand, and uh, the Minutemen are countered by a group of German immigrants who form and start drilling in the Turner Halls, uh, which is the same thing in the, in the predecessor of uh, the restaurant down Cape, the New Orleans, which was a Turnovan Hall, which was a, it was kind of like a physical, kind of like health point where you bulk up and things like that, where you exercise and hold big uh, events. Uh, so, Lyon, with his pro-Union German, surround the camp and capture the Minutemen, and they're marching them back to downtown St. Louis to incarcerate them. And a shot is fired, and uh, about 28 people, both uh, military and civilians, are killed, and approximately 75 are wounded. Two prominent people, which we hear about a lot later, witness uh, this march. General Grant, who become General Grant, and Sherman. Sherman and Grant are witnessing this march back. Sherman with his sons, I understand, and then he, uh, they both witness it. And at this time, because of this, Sterling Price now, who has been basically neutral, uh, aligns with uh, Jackson and the Democrats. And the State Guard command, he's appointed State Guard Commander, which is equivalent to our Adjutant General now, the Missouri Army and Air National Guard in Jefferson City. So Price and at that time Brigadier General Harney, who is the Commandant of St. Louis uh, District, come to a conclusion and they actually agreed to a non-aggression pact. Federal and Union forces will not be used to enforce any insurrections in the state of Missouri, St. Louis, and Price says our Minutemen or our National Guard will take care of all those incursions so you won't have to incite anti-Southern feelings. We'll handle all of the legal matters. Now, you had extremists on both sides who opposed this agreement because, you know, you have the firebrands who are advocating uh, revolution, you have the Unionists who are advertising keeping, keeping Missouri in the uh, Union, and General Harney for some reason is reassigned because of the political influence of the Blair family in St. Louis who were strong Republicans and uh, a couple of them knew Lincoln personally, one of them was appointed postmaster under Lincoln. So Lyon now meets with uh, Jackson and Price and he and Blair talk at the old Planters Hotel in St. Louis for about six or seven hours to try to reach some kind of a reasonable accommodation. And after nothing happening, which is settling Lyon as a firebrand, and he actually tells Jackson, we are declaring war on Missouri. You have one hour to evacuate the city under my escort. So basically, he rich Jackson in price from St. Louis and the state. At that time, Jackson gets over into Jeff City, issues a call for about 50,000 militia volunteers to protect Missourians, and he repositions to Boonville along the Missouri River, then down to Lamar in southwest Missouri, birthplace of Harry Truman. Then uh, on the 19th of July in 1861, 18 19 July, 18, he escapes to Little Rock, Arkansas, being forced out or evicted from Missouri. Now he goes uh, to Richmond, Virginia, meets with Jefferson Davis to try to secure support for uh, 
the, the uh, Missouri forces and Davis promises uh, support as soon as Missouri secedes. And the Southern Congress then can appropriate funds and support legally. Then he travels to Memphis. He issues the Proclamation of Independence, uh, Jackson does, and uh, says Missouri is now independent and sovereign. And of course, this carries no legal uh, authority. And in August of 61, he's with General Price and General Ben McCulloch from Arkansas to witness uh, Lyon's defeat and death at the Battle of Wilson's Creek, or what the Confederates uh, called Oak Hills, uh, a little bit south of Springfield. Then he returns to Springfield as the Union forces retreat with Price in September. He keeps going north to Lexington, Missouri, and witnesses uh, Price's greatest uh, success in the Battle of the Hemp Bales, uh, which is kind of a famous uh, battle in the state of Missouri and has its own uh, interests. And during his absence from the state, the newspapers now within the state, both the Democratic, the Whig, and uh, get together and kind of repudiate his actions and blame him for the war situation in Missouri. So now his own press has turned against him because there's extreme guerrilla warfare going on throughout the state. In October 28th, he convenes the 21st General Assembly in Neosho, Missouri, down in southwest Missouri. And this is basically a rump legislature. He doesn't have a quorum of duly elected legislatures, so what he does, he sends his people out into the the city and area and stuff like that, and uh, swears in legislators uh, who have proxies to vote for the duly elected legislators who wouldn't be there, and they pass an ordinance of secession, which is based on his course guidance and instructions. It has no legal authority because the duly elected legislators did not uh, vote personally. So now, the large population of Missouri's residents refused to reorganize, recognize and obey this ordinance of secession. Now, October the 28th, 1862, the Confederate Congress finally admitted Missouri as a full and equal member of the 12th Confederate state. So now you have two governments claiming to govern Missouri. You have the southern government under Price, and then you have the appointed Union Governor, Gamble, uh, both go trying to claim Missouri. Gamble has the advantage. He's here. Jackson's not here. You know, he's wondering around. So Jackson actually believed that he and Missouri were independent from Richmond. They didn't really want to, the ties of the Confederacy, except for when they needed money, when they needed men, and when they needed military supplies. So early in December of 1862, Jackson is still on the road, which after the eviction of Missouri, he's on the road constantly. And he goes to New Orleans for the winter, and he comes briefly back to uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, where he dies of stomach cancer on December the 7th, 1862. A stranger in a strange land, Arkansas, much like the Confederate state of Missouri itself. That's the end of the presentation. Do you have any questions? So, yes? Um, when he was governor, did he do anything other than try to mow through the, the war issue at all? He didn't have all that power because the Union had thousands of troops in Missouri. So Jackson really had a disorganized militia. And they were they were the Missouri forces a lot of time, which uh, one of the books that uh, Beth has there uh, in Deadly Earnest, they were all siphoned off east of the river to fight for the Confederacy. And the only folks you had back in Missouri were some National Guard contingents and uh, Jeff Thompson's guerrillas down in uh, you know, the Boot Hill area and so forth, and the guerrilla actions. So he had no real military power. Couldn't do anything. And he's, he's evicted from the state, basically. He can't come back into control. Land. Sterling Price is commanding the Missouri troops that are fighting with the Confederacy. Again, east of the river. 
So he's got no, he's got no leverage in Missouri at all. So, and for as far as the running of the government, it just was no. just nothing much done. He, he, was, he, was, he was running the government while he was running back and <laughs> forth. So, you know, and, and he couldn't yeah. do anything legally because Missouri uh, came under the union control and uh, had its own appointed governor uh, to run the states legally or illegally, depending on which side you're <laughs> So Missouri appointed governor, that was a military man? No. Who no. did the appointing? I think his name was Gamble. Who appointed? The president. President, president Lincoln. Lincoln. Yeah. Appointed well, the yeah. acting governor. Yeah, sure, sure. And yet, you know, he didn't have an election. When Jackson goes out of the state, uh, very quickly, Missouri came kind of under uh, martial law to a certain extent. And so they had to have some type of civilian authority as a figurehead, you know, so that they could do business with Missouri. But what, so then the only who enforced the law? The Union troops? The, the Union military. Okay. Military District of St. Louis. And then, of course, the Union forces fighting, uh, like Island Number 10 down uh, here in New Madrid, a big battle, uh, a lot of, and we uh, we had a lot of guerrilla problems. And the, there's another book that Beth has over there, it's called Inside War by Michael Feldman, and talks about the guerrilla warfare in the state of Missouri, and I was telling her before uh, we started, uh, I saw a Missouri Historical Review publication that talked about that the German community up in the west central part of the state, uh, primarily the Germans, and the guerrillas came up, uh, Bloody Bill Anderson being primarily the one, and just completely almost annihilated those citizens. Just, you know, you call about rape, pillage, and burn, that was, it was terrible. And of course, the, the Germans, all they wanted, the heritage, all they wanted to do was be left alone so they could farm and do their thing. But uh, these folks came up and, you know, were getting all their crops to support themselves, basically. It was not a good time in the state of Missouri during the 1860s. Yeah, so was the legislature functioning then? You had a uh, governor basically appointed by the union that ruled by edict primarily. More or less martial law. Exactly. Exactly. Because you know you had the muscles to support it, and all you were doing were fighting guerrillas and, and the partisans, which is not a good. It's not an equal contest. You know, it's like trying to get a good handful of jello. You know, no, there there was no uh, defined legislature during that time. So the law and order pretty well broke down except for there were bodies of organized Well, there were strong forces. bodies of union forces, Tom. And the guerrillas themselves, some of them were one side or the other, but a lot of them were just outlaws, right? True. You know, they were True. just... Yeah, a lot of, uh, some of them were southern deserters or uh, Missourians who had formerly enlisted and got tired of that silly business. Uh, you know, when, when you don't have any equipment, uh, you're without weapons, you're you're walking barefooted and stuff like that uh, through rain, snow, hail, and ice. And uh, you're living off of uh, green corn and acorns and stuff like that. Not a good time. Not a good time for the Missouri. And the South. Southern Confederacy, what did they have to really legally support them? You know, they were doing all their business uh, in the Eastern Theater. Or we'd say East of the Mountains. Sad time for Missouri. Sad time for Missouri, unfortunately. But we've survived, in spite of ourselves, maybe. Thanks for being here, guys. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, don't forget, uh, third Sunday of every month, 2 p.m., Hannibal Lutheran Church. We have very, very interesting programs, and uh, you're invited to be a guest anytime. There's no obligation to, to join our organization. We're uh, really an expensive organization. We, our dues is $20 a, a year. Um, do you have a website, or is there a way to find out what the topics will be? Uh, there's a newsletter which the membership receives, and in the uh, Saturday, uh, Friday Missourian, there's a little uh, blip, and then in the Sunday's uh, Missourian, in the features area of, of, of the events or something like that, usually there's a, a little more uh, broad encapsulation of what the program is concerned. 
I'm interested in it, my husband especially. Good, good. Come join us. Come join. 